Hello everyone, um, welcome back to another live stream. Um, today's conversation is about future trends and future technologies. And to do this, I am joined today by Yasmid Seti and uh, Christina Pandrea from Ericsson's Consumer Lab. And we will discuss some of the main future trends that have been identified by Ericsson. And we will explore the role of technology in all of this. We'll touch on things like artificial intelligence and extended reality and resilient networks and the role of 5G and so on. So. Welcome, Yasmid, and welcome, Christina. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Bernard. Yeah, such a pleasure to have you have you with me today. Um, maybe be a, a good place to start is maybe if you give us a, a little overview of yourself, what you do, and especially what the Ericsson Consumer Lab is. Um, Yasmid, do you want to kick this off? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Bernard, and uh, great to be here. Uh, let me start by by saying that uh, you know Ericsson Consumer Lab is a is a very unique uh, organization, uh, largely because you know we are responsible for bringing in the voice of the consumer into the organization uh, into various units within Ericsson, but also advising a lot of our uh, you know ICT uh, customers, uh, telcos across the globe on how to stay ahead of some of the trends that we see in, in the consumer market. And we've been doing this for uh, the past 25 years. Uh, you know, every time going out, spending hours and hours uh, sitting down with consumers, trying to understand uh, how they use new technology, what is the perception on new emerging technologies. And we gather all this data in-house uh, with a massive uh, big data platform that we have. We call this the uh, Ericsson Consumer Lab analytical platform, and it's 25 years worth of data, which allows us to actually also look back in time uh, and see how some of the trends that we have forecasted uh, have manifested, uh, but also use that in order to uh, come out with an educated guess on what might happen uh, in the next uh, five to 10 year uh, sort of horizon. So uh, an excellent group of uh, researchers, you know, that I have the privilege of uh, leading up. And we are part of a bigger uh, organization, which is Ericsson Research, uh, which is at the forefront of, uh, you know, all the technology research that we do at Ericsson. Uh, very bright researchers that are possibly looking at uh, not just 5G, but now also 6G uh, going forward. So yeah, a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, and, and also, I think for the past two, three years, what is interesting is that we are taking our research out of the lab, out of the desk, into conceptual prototypes and, and innovation, uh, which is really helping us visualize what that future might actually look like. And I think that's really exciting. That's fascinating. Um, <clears throat> Christina, do you want to quickly say what, what you do at the lab? Yes, absolutely. So I've been with the Consumer Lab for the past four years now, uh, almost, uh, which is, you know, time flies, it's incredible. And I've uh, I've started in this role uh, as a statistician with the, with, with the foot in, in all uh, our analytical studies and in our statistical understanding of the data that we have got, gathered from consumers. And then I've just grown into this role in, in starting to lead projects. And I have been heavily involved in driving the 5G consumer potential studies in previous years together with uh, with just me and now i'm uh, heading and and leading um uh, the the startup 5g program uh, which is an initiative that we're actually going to talk about uh, uh, during this call today which is uh, our ambition to basically just get out of the office as just me was saying and, and trying to to step in into the ecosystem and try to help our customers and try to help the innovators uh in the in the industry to kind of connect to each other and realize the trends that we keep talking about. Very good. This is super exciting. I can't wait to start talking about some of the trends that you've identified and some of the enabling technologies. Um, before we do this, I just want to want to acknowledge everyone saying hello here. This is great to see you joining from all over the world. We've got uh, Hasnain here from Malaysia joining in. We've got Afi from New Jersey. We've got Andres from Colombia, Ahmed from Egypt, um, Malka from Sri Lanka. It's really good to see you all on the stream. And Miguel from Colombia. Uh, we've got someone from South Africa. Um, 
Gomet from Canada. We've got people from Vienna, from Iran, from all across the US, from Texas. So it's really great to see everyone joining in. We've got uh, Banda from Saudi Arabia, um, Zuraj from India, um, someone from Finland. So it's great. Please carry on saying hello. But also let us know if you have any questions, if there's anything in particular you're interested in around technology trends, maybe around technology like 5G, then put this into the comments and we will try to address them during the live session. Okay, let's let's get to the exciting bit then, uh, Yasmeet. Uh, maybe you can outline for us the key technology trends that Ericsson has identified, that you have identified in the Consumer Lab, that will really drive the, the next few years and some of the key changes that you're expecting to see. Yeah, ex exactly. So. I think Bernard, uh, you know, we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that we are in this new normal uh, now with with the pandemic, and uh, a lot of work that we do at Consumer Lab, the emphasis of that is letting consumers, uh, you know, voice out what they think about the future. Uh, and of course, as as us as researchers, we can then put our lens on top of it and and see, you know, what is the merit in terms of what consumers are telling us. So uh, it's exciting that. You know, during uh, this pandemic, the peak period, uh, somewhere around June and July, we went out and we did a massive study with with consumers all across the globe, uh, and and we gleaned a lot of data uh, to talk about what are those sort of technology trends that are going to manifest uh, or possibly accelerate because of the pandemic, uh, and it was a challenging task as well because uh, you know you had to go out in the middle of the pandemic, you know. Uh, while sounding empathetic because of the the loss of human lives that have happened but also be very close to the end consumers to understand uh, what is their sentiment you know how is technology really helping them with with their day to day lives and one thing which came out very clearly was the the importance of networks as such and i and i think as as working with ericsson we are extremely proud of being part of uh, that sort of ecosystem where we are able to connect uh, and and help society in these difficult times. So we now see one of the most fundamental trends is that networks are being redefined. Uh, you know, the the importance of resilience connectivity is not just about good to have. It's perhaps most important now uh, in this sort of crisis. And and when we when we spoke with consumers, you know, about eight in ten consumers globally say that, uh, you know, ICT and particularly connectivity has helped them uh, go through this this crisis and and you know sail through. Uh, we can only imagine if we didn't have uh, you know connectivity support for video conferencing to keep ourselves productive, uh, or you know carry on with schooling for children, or even connect uh, you know our our vulnerable segments in the society, which is the seniors. Uh, in in the society, and and we clearly see that even that segment is telling us that uh, network resilience is is going to be very very important. So I think the 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 focus is going to be now on how we can uh, you know keep the focus on uh, ensuring that the networks are up and running and can deliver the best possible performance in situations like this. We have seen, of course, massive uh, usage of the mobile network, uh, almost a 40% increase on the mobile data side, uh, 70 plus percent increase on the fixed uh, broadband side. Uh, but but you know what we see is that uh, the telcos have been rewarded uh, for ensuring this sort of resilience in the form of uh, great customer loyalty. Uh, and, and also, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say an increased trust in what the telcos are, are actually providing. So as an industry, I think we, we are really glad that we were able to be part of this uh, sort of change. Now, uh, moving from networks being redefined, uh, I think the another trend that, that we see is more the emphasis on telehealth. Uh, and that's what we call, uh, you know, synchronous care. Uh, we have seen that now with the pandemic, uh, you know, the physical visits uh, to your doctors are not going to be possible and, and you would try to avoid that as well. So if you just look at US, for example, back in 2019, just about 11% of consumers were, uh, you know, going into and taking up telehealth visits. Now that's increased to about 46%, uh, you know, globally. So it's a massive change that we have seen in the acceptance of uh, telehealth and, and that is now becoming more important. 
but I see that there are going to be a lot of technologies that would be needed in order to offer uh, this sort of uh, great telehealth experience, whether it's going to be reliable video conferencing, uh, security and reliability of transfer of data with your physicians. Uh, so all those things would, would come in, but this is a trend that we see is, is going to get accelerated. So telehealth is, is another area. Now, moving on further, uh, the third trend is about borderless workspaces, which is all about uh, you know the, the boundaries between work and home now getting blurred because uh, we we are spending almost I would say nine to ten months now uh, you know working from home, and that is creating a bit of expectations in uh, in the in the mind of uh, you know white collar professionals, but but workers generally as well about what is the future now, uh, and we believe that the future will be more about. Uh, you know, flexibility. Uh, we have seen that the work from home, yes, can be productive, uh, but we have also seen that consumers are now starting to feel a bit of that fatigue and, and mental stress. Uh, and it is, it is also becoming more important to think about the mental well-being of the employees uh, going into this uh, remote, uh, you know, work era. So we feel that, you know, when we are asked to predict what's going to happen with, with remote working, we believe, yes, this trend has been accelerated. Uh, employers will offer more flexibility to the employees, but the workplace is not going anywhere. Uh, you know, the workplace is still going to be there. It's It's more that we will have the flexibility of choosing uh, you know, how many days we actually essentially want to work uh, remotely. And that flexibility by itself uh, is going to offer a peace of mind to a lot of employees in balancing uh, their, their work and their personal life. So the importance of technology also comes here uh, because now with remote uh, workplaces, uh, we are relying on uh, uh, the end consumer's Wi-Fi and in his home to kind of keep up with access to all the uh, the the official uh, resources and tools so it's important to think about cybersecurity it's important to think about devices uh, and how that is really going to interplay uh, in in this uh, sort of era so very good you know, just just before you go across the next laura is is saying yes working from home is is exhausting definitely so um, this is this is definitely something that that we we've realised. I think the the whole flexible working environment has given us more flexibility and actually has actually boosted productivity in lots of organisations. But we need to exactly as you say, get, to, get getting the right balance, creating this hybrid, more flexible environment. Okay, carry on. No, your, uh, your, talking your talking about that as well, and and I will acknowledge uh, those comments about you know work from home being being stressful, and it's it's stressful because uh, you know the boundaries between work and home are are now blurred. You know you were spending some time commuting where you were switching off, uh, you know both going to the office and now coming back uh, from the office, and and that sort of boundaries uh, do not exist. Mm -hmm. Now what we need to think about is where can technologies come in that can help us solve some of this isolation, loneliness, the need for human connections? And that's where we believe immersive technologies uh, like virtual reality, for, for example, can, can actually help. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, just as an example, you know, within the team, we are now having all these uh, headsets, which are the Oculus Quest 2 headsets, right? And we, the reason why we have these headsets is that we have moved our physical meetings into the virtual environment. Uh, you know, now we are possibly having virtual coffees in in a in a virtual environment that could be a beach, a cafe, a basketball court where Christina and me can can interact virtually. And with the help of spatial sound, the sense of immersion is as if I'm closer to my colleagues. Uh, in a virtual environment. So I, I think this has actually helped me a lot, you know, in solving uh, a lot of this social isolation that that we've been facing. So the workplace, you know, might actually move into these immersive environments going forward. And that's where the whole technology piece uh, is, is going to come in. But uh, so far, I think the challenge has been, how do you move what you're doing on your PC uh, mm -hmm. and your PC applications to the virtual reality environment. And if we can solve that part, I, I think it would be really interesting to, to look at the future workplace in a immersive environment. Very good. Let, let, let's bring Christina in here as well. Yes. And uh, you've been patiently sitting there. So there's, there's, there's 
idea of having meetings and meetups in virtual reality uh, just e explain to anyone watching or listening how this is different and, and how it makes you feel differently and, and whether, is it better? I can tell you about our first experience as a group, uh, ho hopping on, on this platform and actually having our first kickoff uh, meeting in VR. And I can tell you that the experience was really, really genuine. It, it kind of took us by surprise. Of course, all of us have tested VR before, but it was the first time we actually saw 25 people in the same room, in the same virtual room, mm -hmm. and have this experience where you actually go to people and talk to people one by one, or, you know, talk in bigger groups. So I think what, what was the, the most interesting part for me, and we, we were debating in the team as well, was the fact that uh, in a way you have the same behavior in virtual world as you do in a, in a real setup. So for example, we are a diverse team of researchers, all working with different topics, with consumers, with industries, with, with uh, sustainability. And so naturally, during the discussions that we had, we would, you know, group by the themes that we that were connecting us. So, for example, the Consumer Lab team was all together, you know, uh, cracking jokes at each other, talking about the, the latest uh, uh, reports and what we've done or, uh, or the next steps. And the sustainability team was doing the same and the industry team was doing the same. So I would say in a way, even if you are in a virtual uh, environment and you're remote physically in in the virtual setup it, it's a it's you again uh it, it's you are a person in there you you see the other ones uh, as avatars and you get this sense of of being together with the other ones and it makes a world of a difference um even if you would imagine you know i, I see each other we see each other here uh, over a video call it should be okay but actually being able to turn around and see that there's a person there and you hear another one talking uh, you know from 10 meters apart it makes it makes a world of a difference wow. and uh, you know speaking about uh, borderless uh, offices and dematerialized offices we have recently launched um, a report uh, looking at the future of remote working in 10 15 years from now and it is called the dematerialized office by 2030 and uh, what People that we have interviewed as, at, as part of that study, what they're telling us is that they expect technology to improve even further. So they expect a host of devices and a host of, uh, of um, uh, technology like, you know, augmented reality headsets, VR headsets, wearables, uh, sensors, um, electrons, uh, all placed on the body to help us enhance these virtual meetings. So, um, uh, we talk a lot about the Internet of Senses uh, at Ericsson Consumer Lab and how the Internet of Senses will help us um, um, basically, how, how should I call it, um, enhance all our senses and use all our senses in, in the virtual world, like smell and taste and touch as well, because today we only see and we can only hear, but we cannot do anything else. And so by 2030, uh, we actually believe that with uh, the proper wearables, with haptic feedback, with haptic devices, you we would be able to have this session, you know, in a virtual LinkedIn setup, our audience would be avatars in the venue. We would be able to shake hands with them to say hello. If someone is listening in from, from a time zone where there is morning right now, they could smell the smell of, uh, the, uh, of uh, fresh brewed coffee or they could smell something that you decide, Bernard, to have as the, the you know, uh, custom smell for your all LinkedIn sessions here. Uh, and we could engage and talk and um, do the same things as, as you, we would do in a, in a large uh, setup, in a large real setup, actually. Amazing. So well, coming back to your Smith then, the, the role of avatars in the future then, or your digital persona, will this become much more important? I, I think so as well. I mean, and, and that's the trend that we have also talked about, which is this whole virtual experience economy and the rise of this virtual experience economy. You know, all of us are obsessed with status and, and the status is driven by our materialistic, you know, physical belongings. But as you start spending more and more time in virtual environments, the importance of those materialistic physical goods is going to be much less then the status I actually drive in the virtual environment. Now, if you look at the young millennials, 
uh, they are already driven by that virtual status, whether it's going to be the best gamer status in, in esports uh, or, you know, the number of followers that I possibly possibly have on social media. You know, the, the millennials already understand this uh, now, but that trend is, is now going to get accelerated as we start moving into the virtual experience economy. And how the pandemic has, has actually changed is if you start looking at different areas, you know, of course, you have gaming and, and esports that has been accelerated a lot uh, during this period. I think we saw on the networks that uh, most of the most of the network traffic was being driven by gaming uh, related sort of applications because you wanted to kill time, you wanted to inter entertain yourself uh, in the lockdown. But also that a lot of physical events have now moved into digital events and immersive events. Uh, and, and it was interesting, I don't know if you've seen, but now we have an operator in UK called Everything Everywhere or BT. And they, they did a campaign when they launched the iPhone 12, where they took Rita Ora, which is a famous uh, British singer, and this live streamed her in augmented reality over a 5G network, right? So that talks about, you know, what's going to happen with physical experiences or concerts or sporting events in the future. You know, you will have this personalized uh, experience with augmented reality or, you know, being in a virtual environment and having this 360 degree experience. And your status will be driven by you know, how you are perceived in that virtual environment and not necessarily, uh, you know, what car I drive or what I wear, because my avatar possibly is my own uh, customization of how I want to portray myself in the in the social era. So really exciting, you know, how this this change is, has been accelerated now because of the, uh, you know, this whole era of uh, virtual uh, virtual and immersion and, and and it's also interesting that we've been talking about virtual reality for, for the past i would say 7 to 8 years mm -hmm. and a lot of analysts have said oh you know now virtual reality is really going to kick off you know now we will see uh, a majority of the headset uh, sales happening but it has not happened so far and now in the pandemic we suddenly start seeing uh, an, an emergence of virtual reality that we have never seen before and that is a combination of both the pandemic driving it, but also how the ecosystem drives it. So we just talked about Oculus Quest 2. Uh, the pricing of that headset is 300 US dollars. I mean, that has almost almost half of what the virtual reality headset pricing was. And it's much better device. It's much sharper device. And, and the resolution is much better. So the technology has also developed in such a way that we can actually make immersive technologies go mass market. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just add from, from a social perspective and, and from a researcher a research perspective, uh, what is happening right now is an experiment on scale, a natural experiment on scale. We kept talking about remote work, for example. Uh, if we would have asked corporations 10 years ago to send everyone work remotely, that would have been a no-go area, right? But now we're all working from home, uh, you know, uh, white collar workers, uh, medical professionals sometimes, uh, institutions and entities of all kinds of sorts. I even children are, are studying from home nowadays. So we have this massive uh, and, and this very, very, very big experiment, natural experiment that is happening right now. And we see that the digital technology technologies are actually coping with our needs. And I think this is, you know, a, a fundamental change uh, that is showing that we might have reached the, the digital tipping point. Uh, and with it, the new technologies will just flourish going forward. Absolutely, absolutely. That's the, the whole reason why I've just finished a, a, my, my latest book on extended reality, which will come out next year. So I'm excited. And I could talk about this topic forever. So just going back to yes, mate, you, you, your key trends. So resilient networks, telehealth, borderless workspaces, and maybe in the future, dematerialized um, offices. And then we talked about this whole experience economy immersive technology did i admit did, was there anything else that you identified? yeah i think the the other area which which i think is important is uh you know which we have highlighted in a trend is what we call autonomous commerce where we are talking about the automation of how deliveries and contactless interactions are essentially now being accelerated because of the pandemic. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, uh, just a, a couple of days back, I shared on my LinkedIn post how in Shanghai, uh, KFC now has uh, autonomous trucks 
uh, which are uh, you know which are operating entire city and you can just go on to that truck you know with facial recognition technology get your order you don't need to interact with the kfc staff and and you know this this technology is all powered by by uh, sensors and lidar sensors on the on the autonomous uh, trucks but also 5g at the other end as well so uh, you know that raises a question about is this really the future of fast food industry you know is is you know how the pandemic has probably accelerated this uh, whole need for optimization of uh, deliveries and it also raises a question about whether you know we will start to see the end of cash uh, in a lot of emerging economies, you know, now consumers are expressing a hesitancy to carry a lot of cash because of the, uh, you know, hygiene involved with, uh, you know, and, and the fear of, of uh, the pandemic and the coronavirus. And that has also accelerated uh, a push towards more contactless uh, payment technologies and so forth. So we see that happening a, a lot in, in a lot of emerging markets, whether that is going to be in India or, uh, you know, Africa, where, Af where the e-commerce system is, is already very evolved, but also in Europe uh, as well. But Europe was already well ahead on the contactless le payment transaction. It was more the emerging economies where cash is still the king, but that might actually change going forward mm -hmm. with uh, this trend of uh, autonomous commerce. Very good. So we've got those four amazing trends that we're seeing. Um, what are some of the underpinning technologies then that will enable us to really use this and thrive this? So what are the kind of technologies that you are talking to your clients about that you are seeing people adopting and therefore really driving their, their own future business success? Um, right. What what would you highlight there as the key technology trends? Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, uh, there's no way we can go uh, around and not talk about 5G, but let, I let just me to, uh, do that. But I want to I, I want to talk about AI and the fact that I, be, I, I really believe that the artificial intelligence is going to be uh, weaven into all the fabrics of our human lives, uh, whether if we talk about uh, e-commerce, if we talk about uh, health and education, uh, even in the way our networks are delivered uh, to the people, even them are going to use AI going forward. Uh, so what we do at Ericsson Research now, one of the technology trends that we're following and working towards is basically creating autonomous networks. Uh, these are networks that are able to, to uh, detect and uh, prevent and actually heal themselves, depending on what's happening in the network uh, environment and in the network setup. So, for example, if there's a if there's a stadium where there's a concert and there's a huge crowd of people that are gathering and streaming uh, videos in 4K to their social platforms, or if they engage in game multiplayer augmented reality games at the stadium, the networks automatically detect that there's a huge demand of data uh, at that particular location. So the network resources are dynamically dynamically allocated to that particular area for the time um, that it takes you know for the concert to happen um, without affecting the the network data traffic in other areas and so when the when the event is over the network resources are re uh, relocated to the place uh, where it matters most and this is something that we we've, we've been working towards and continuously emphasizing with our customers as well which is basically creating these um, uh, networks that are aware and independent and be able to detect whether you know there's there's a problem with the with the charging system there's a problem with the electricity there's a problem with with a group of people that are doing crazy stuff over the, over the network you know the network will be able to to self heal um and and react to all of these uh, happenings in the network so that's Sorry, the yeah. yeah no I, I i agree and it's a great example and anyone who's ever listen to anything I talk about and or write about knows that I believe that AI is the most transformative technology that we have have ever had access to and it will transform all aspects and is fundamental to all the five trends that that you've outlined. Um, sure. So what what other trends you made other than than AI which is obviously absolutely fundamental. Yeah, so so I think uh, AI is is of course an important trend, and and then of course, we we see that uh, you know XR possibly, and and this is a subject that you are passionate about, Bernard. Uh, you know, I I believe XR is going to be the new video uh, running on onto the networks uh, in the future. Yeah, We've been XR standing for extended reality, just in exactly case. exactly. So it's an umbrella term which 
which encompasses, uh, you know, both mixed reality, augmented reality, and virtual reality. And and I feel that, uh, you know, for for quite a few years we've been stuck with uh, 2D video, uh, you know, and 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 I think. Uh, if you look at the 3G era, uh, the lead use cases were mobile web. We moved to 4G, and that just blew up the whole, uh, you know, video uh, use case and and video usage just went off the roof. Now we are in the in the 5G era, and and with the characteristics and and of 5G, with the low latency, with extra capacity that that is going to be available, this is the connectivity fabric that is really going to make XR possibly go mainstream. Uh, so we talked a lot about virtual reality. And I think one technology which I'm really excited about is augmented reality, because there we are not constrained with the devices, because we already hold those devices in our hands today. So I believe that augmented reality is, is really going to be a technology which will transform uh, a lot of different areas. Uh, so far, we have just seen augmented reality in the area of gaming. Uh, I think all of us can relate to Pokemon Go as the most popular, you know, augmented reality game. But that was more first-generation implementation of augmented reality. Now with 5G, uh, we will be able to see much more realistic, high-fidelity 3D models uh, that are going to transform the way we look at shopping in the future in retail. Uh, whether it's going to be education, uh, you know, how we will we will learn in an immersive environment how we can possibly also train uh, and and at work you know we maybe there could be 3d models that we can collaborate on at the same time in in augmented reality as such so i think that augmented reality has as a technology is is going to be something which will scale uh, on the back of uh, 5g uh, because that's going to be the foundation layer which enables a lot of these uh, xr technologies to really go ahead and and that again will lead to a lot of new devices and new form factors uh, that would come in. I mean, we all of our research that we have done predict, a lot of consumers are predicting that by 2025, we will all be wearing augmented reality glasses. Uh, we know uh, from uh, the manufacturers of the most popular uh, you know, phones that we hold in our hand, that everybody is now working on getting these pieces of glasses uh, ready by the 2022, 2023 sort of uh, time frame. So the future is not that far away. I think we will already start to see some of these uh, technologies come to the fore and, and experience maybe the, the first generation of these technologies. And then it's going to evolve as we go on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And when, when I talk to friends or talk to children, friends of my kids, for example, and we talk about augmented reality, a really nice way to demonstrate this is actually just Googling dinosaurs. And mm -hmm. you have now the option to see it in, in augmented reality on your phone and you can place the dinosaur into your room and you can walk around it. And this is just this is what everyone can do already. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. And, and I think the great i mean the very exciting part about it is that these augmented reality experiences will will go outside of the home environment going forward and i think you know that's where the expectations uh, of people are also lying in the capacity and in the capability of just walking the streets pointing your smartphone today and your and your uh, ar glass in the future at the building and just getting a wiki page if you really want to know what's happening in that building or or the history of it or maybe see augmented reality uh, ads and commercials to and discounts to the things you love and like around the city and, and and the very critical component to all this is computation uh which is going to happen over the cloud because you want to de your device to be light not to to have a lot of batteries you don't want to do the processing in the device because then it will heat up and so all that will happen over the network uh with the additional computation that is needed for uh positioning Right, because this is one of the main challenges uh, with augmented reality today. Uh, these uh, spatial anchors that need to be placed uh, at the city scale to actually have these persistent augmented reality objects that we can all interact with from different uh, from different angles. And then there's another another big challenge, which you know, um, for for a user that has not been uh, so so familiar with AR before, it, it, there's a sense that the augmented reality maybe is not as natural, and that is the fact that we're working very much in the augmented reality space now with dynamic occlusion. So the, uh, the this this dynamic way of the augmented reality object to 
be represented as realistic as possible. And uh, so you have the capacity of blocking the visual with objects, with real physical objects that are placed uh, around basically. And that's, you know, that requires a lot of computational power, capturing the image, uh, rendering everything over the cloud, placing the objects object, uh, on, on in the real world. And, and all that is going to, uh, to happen uh, together with 5G. Absolutely. So, so for me, you you talked about your your Quest Two headsets. They are already um, they have no cables. They are standalone devices, which is a big step forward. In the future, we will have those five G connected, and you can walk around anywhere. You don't rely on on any fast networks or Wi Fi in in your space. So this is they are enabling technologies. Absolutely. Exactly, uh, and it's interesting that you talked about. Uh, you know VR and and we we do expect those headsets to now encompass 5G. Uh, I, it was interesting. A few days back, I spoke with one of the startups called V Spatial, and they were featured by uh, you know Facebook recently because what they are doing is giving you the ability to move all your applications that you work on in a Windows 10 environment on a PC into virtual reality. So it's like as if taking your workspace. Uh, into virtual reality. Uh, and for us, that is very exciting because uh, so far we are using work, uh, VR more to connect and, and socialize. Uh, but if we can figure out how to essentially take all the work workspace related applications uh, into virtual reality. So maybe I can give, assign one virtual screen to each application in a virtual environment. And, and pretty much work from everywhere. So the future of work is not just from home, it is essentially from anywhere. It could be from a cafe, from sitting in a garden, on a bus. Uh, you know, That's what, what I think the technology is gonna enable us. 100%. Um, earlier on, you talked about that you are actually working with a, a few startups. You're, you're working with companies who want to leverage some of these technologies to innovate. Um, why are you doing this? Uh, Christina, do you want to talk about the, the Ericsson Startup 5G program and, and, and why you work with startups? Yes, and then absolutely. We can maybe, and then we can maybe look at some, some actual examples of some of the most innovative things they, they've been doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So ju just to set the scene a little bit, uh, we, we talked about the importance of 5G for, for you know, 5G as an enabler for all these technologies coming forward. And what we see uh, in our research as well and from our forecasts and modeling is that 5G and the technology platform that the service providers are building is going to underpin uh, 31 trillion US dollars in, in revenues by 2030 coming from all these technologies and applications that are being built on top of the platform. And this is something that, uh, you know, can be captured by all the players in the in the ICT segment. And this is a revenue that is uh, dedicated basically to the consumer market. We're not talking about industry. Industries. We're not talking about IoT uh, and any, anything like that. We're talking about the consumer revenue uh, opportunities. And out of this huge pool of money, uh, the, the service providers can uh, realistically capture between 12 and 13% uh, of these revenues, uh, the equivalent of 3.7 um, trillion uh, billion trillion US dollars, sorry. Um, but um, they have to do something different this time around. Uh, from what they did in the 4G era. In order to capture these revenues, they have to look at trying to bundle in on their subscriptions, services and applications that add value to the lives of the consumers and actually speak, uh, speak uh, about the value of 5G um, itself. And so by bundling the services on top of the subscription, you can also charge a premium for it and thereby increasing your enhanced mobile broadband, the uh, wireless revenues going forward. And so we know, you know, we know from our research that uh, this is going to be the trend. We know that we, we need to uh, have an ambition to reach those targets. Uh, but we also understand that it's a very difficult challenge at hand, right? Uh, enabling such services would take a lot of muscle and a lot of money to, to, to invest uh, in such solutions. And that's why we decided as Ericsson to basically step in and to contribute to the efforts of the ecosystem and to help uh, our customers, our tel telecom op operators, to basically expand and, and um, have a better reach uh, towards these innovative companies and possible partners that they could work with. 
So that's the background, and that's why we, we basically uh, came up with the program that is called Startup 5G. And what we do as part of Startup 5G is that we reach out, we have a global uh, reach towards uh, innovative companies around the world that are working with consumer-led applications and services uh, on top of 5G. Uh, we, we basically talk to them, help them hone their propositions and off offerings, and then match make them with service providers that can um, and want uh, to enable new services uh, uh, for their consumers. And that's a little bit of a, a, the, the journey, so to speak, and, and that's a little bit of our mandate here to make these successful matchmakings and to ensure that you know uh, we get the best of uh, the two worlds. We help our customers succeed and we help the ecosystem flourish and, and get connected even better. Wonderful. So what, what are some of your favorite examples then? If you look across your startup ecosystem, who is working on something really cool and innovative that, that you, you can share with us here? We talked a lot about, I mean, in this session particularly about VR, right? Uh, and about the, the, the this period of time where there's a lot of social anxiety, where we spend a lot of time at home and, you know, maybe don't meet each other. So uh, one of the players uh, and one of the companies that we have in our fold right now, uh, it's called XR Space. And these guys are actually solving the issue uh, that you have with uh, with the social distancing, basically, and helping people get, uh, get connected over their, their social VR platform. Uh, they're building the hardware uh, as well as the as the software and the social VR world. But what's cool about their hardware, which I actually have here on my desk because uh, mm -hmm. I use it quite a lot, uh, this is a 5G standalone VR headset. So this is basically taking uh, VR on the move. Uh, you just insert a SIM card uh, here into the device, and then you're just ready to go, ready to go. Uh, right now, we do work a lot from home, but you know, at Consumer Lab, we've seen from years now that uh, working is going to to be performed remotely and even on the go. And uh, as people are going to, you know, go back to their normal lives, they're going to be used to working from basically anywhere, and that's where you need uh, a mobile experience with you, where you can carry your office basically uh, anywhere. So you know, it's a really cool uh, proposition that uh, XR Space uh, has here. Uh, hardware and software. Uh, in the Manova world, you can meet uh, even strangers from anywhere in the world. And I can tell you that's hilarious. Uh, you know, hi, I'm Christina. Nice to meet you. Uh, let's uh, let's play a game. You can play games. Um, uh, you can do social activities. You can learn how to dance. You can do mindfulness exercises. You can train. Uh, you can do brainstorming sessions with your, with your colleagues. So it's a full packed uh, a uh, proposition here that uh, XR Space is bringing to the table. I love it, and anyone who's wa watched Ready Player One can oh, can yeah. hopefully see see that exactly. future. Yes, that, right. that, exactly. that's a great movie. You know, we we have to aim for realizing that. <laughs> I think we are on track. <laughs> Very good. What what other good examples have you got there? Yeah, so I, I since I took up augmented reality, maybe I can I can add here. So we have another uh, startup uh, based in London called Inception XR, and uh, they are working with augmented reality for education. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was that now during the pandemic, we we have seen that there is a disproportionate amount of uh, time that children are spending on the screens, uh, essentially. But it's not all productive. Uh, or a valuable uh, sort of screen time, right? So how do we change uh, that sort of screen time uh, for kids into valuable uh, edutainment uh, related uh, screen time? So what this what this uh, startup is really doing is with the power of 5G and, and cloud uh, rendering, we are turning in uh, normal books into augmented reality uh, 3D uh, books uh, that can help uh, you know a lot of children uh, get a grasp on maybe a different language uh, or, you know, gamify the whole sort of education experience, uh, you know, also enhancing uh, education in a way that we have not 
possibly seen before. And, and we have, from all our research, we have seen that one area that consumers continuously ex expect the telcos to intervene in has been education, you know, especially during the pandemic to provide them with tools and resources that can actually help, uh, you know, progress uh, their children on the education side. So now with this startup, we are now trialing and, and you know, exploring what we can do in bringing uh, to life a lot of these 3D augmented reality books for telcos, you know, across the globe in different languages with the power of 5G. Uh, because once 5G comes in, uh, you know, what we can essentially do is that this application is going to be more network adaptive. So when you have 4G, you can probably get the plain basic vanilla augmented reality experience that can run on 4G. But when you have 5G, we will be able to push up uh, the resolution of the 3D models in augmented reality. So you get a much more richer and an enhanced uh, augmented reality sort of an experience. And, and that is the part which I think is most exci exciting because we believe that in the first few years, 5G coverage is still gonna be very patchy. So we need to look for use cases that can work on 4G very well, but can be enhanced with 5G. And that's where the startup Inception XR kind of comes in. Very good. And and for me, another key area where this sort of technology can make a really a really big difference is in, in entertainment, in Absolutely. sports. Uh, Christina, do you want to talk about Playside as well? Because I, I think they are a great startup and, yes. and use case. Yeah, we actually had a session where we talked about uh, so many companies in our fold, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we see now a challenge when it comes to live sports. First of all, because they get cancelled. And then second of all, because even when they happen, people are, um, for the moment, still not allowed to go back to the venues as they used to. So there's ba there's basically a stringent need to to start um, uh, bringing the live sports experiences uh, in, the, in the homes of the consumers, in their hands, uh, on mobile devices and uh, get back a little bit of that excitement uh, about sports and, and football and cricket and everything, right? So what Playside is doing, uh, and they're doing really, really good, uh, is that they're developing a host of um, AI-enabled cameras uh, that can be deployed at uh, all sorts of venues and, and sports um, um, and, and sports arenas. And uh, these cameras that um, uh, that are distributed, they, can, they are 4K, 8K and, and 360. They record the entire event. They send the entire uh, video that is being recorded synchronously to local servers or to the edge uh, where the entire content is being processed and then delivered uh, to the consumer in, in the, you know, uh, in the best possible way, uh, in the shortest time possible, uh, in a very and highly customizable uh, way in which you, um, as, a, as a couch surfer, as, as a, a person standing home, you can basically uh, swipe through different camera angles. Uh, you can pick to follow your favorite uh, uh, football player and follow that throughout the game. Uh, or you can uh, see all sorts of statistics being displayed in real life as the game is unfolding. Uh, but for this, you basically need uh, a lot of uh, a lot of compute power and and a very strong, uh, resilient connectivity at the venue, in the production phase, and then you need um, a very good connectivity on on the on the distribution part of it because uh, this sort of um, and I strongly believe this uh, this strong of um, uh, watching. Uh, this kind of watching live sports uh, uh, from from on mobile devices and on the go will be something that will be uh, a common thing um, in, in in years from now as esports is being watched right now, right anywhere on the go. And as we do that, you need a, a very good connectivity on the on the distribution side because otherwise you won't see that game in, in that high resolution as you would expect, and you won't get those statistics um, as you would expect uh, naturally. Uh, while watching these live sports, so that's yeah. that's exciting. Yeah, for really me, this is, this is hu hugely exciting, and just the thought of watching your favorite sports from any angle, or you can actually place yourself in the middle of the pitch and actually see what is going on. I I also think about live entertainment concerts, for example, where you can watch it from anywhere, or you can actually put yourself on the stage, stand next to someone like Rita Ora and and experience something completely differently. So this is this is pretty epic. Um, exactly. Um, exactly. 
yes yeah, sorry I, I was just looking through the stream to see uh, um, whether there are a few questions we can answer if you have any specific questions that you want to have an answer to if you're watching this live um, put them into the comment function I'm tr I try to catch up uh, keep up with but there have been so many comments and questions um, so someone Bassam is saying hello from Egypt interesting to see Eric and folks discussing futuristic trends amazing stuff so people are happy excited Thank you, Bassam. Um, someone was asking about security um, how security is managed over 5g uh, security came up a few times already um, any any views on that while well, I'm trying to find the question? I think fundamentally, I mean, uh, you know, when we are thinking about 5G, it's it's uh, security by design, you know, in, in a way on, on the 5G side. So needless to say, I think uh, the whole area of privacy and, and integrity of data is, is very important in anything that we possibly do. Uh, it was important even in the 4G era, and, and I think it's going to be important even in the, in the 5G era as well. And I think what what we've seen as i was alluding to uh, you know earlier in the pandemic is that now there is much more trust on the telcos so with with trust you know comes a greater responsibility to actually deliver on that consumer trust as well uh, during the pandemic we actually saw that a lot of telcos were essentially were using anonymized data to look at mobility patterns on a city level and help local governments uh, understand uh, you know whether restrictions and, and lockdown restrictions were being adhered to or not and this was just an example of how anonymized data analytics efforts could be used for good and that is what consumers are alluding to that you know they're they're willing to share a lot of this data uh, if it comes for a for a common good but of course you know how this data is then kind of processed and and shared with third parties need to be made much more uh, you know transparent uh, and with 5G we are entering into an era where we will not just connect smartphones but we will connect a lot of sensors a lot of new types of devices and so forth which does bit bring bring a lot of complexity on managing uh, you know, security of a lot of these devices. But needless to say, you know, teams at Ericsson as well as on the telco side are uh, have acknowledged this fact and they're working together in order to kind of ensure that security is being considered by design when we are deploying these networks. Very good. I've got a question here from Dion who is watching us on YouTube at the moment. And he, I, I guess blockchain is one of those technologies yes. things that very often comes up that we, we haven't touched on today. So Dion is asking, uh, do, do you see a major use of blockchain and peer to peer transacting in the future? Um, yeah. I think it's it's an important uh, aspect of blockchain. And, and I can give you an example of how this is being used by an operator today in the 5G uh, sort of space. So you have this operator, uh, SK Telecom in, in South Korea, who has this new uh, quantum security uh, sort of application uh, that they have deployed on a 5G phone. And the quantum security application is, is, is then essentially blockchain, which is generating a random code every time you're doing a transaction uh, in order to offer greater security, both for offline as well as online transactions uh, that you're doing. So with the help of this technology, now SK you know, kind of claims that all your uh, online and off offline transaction are probably secured in a sense that we have never seen before. And this is just one example of how blockchain technology essentially could be used. Uh, now there is an extension of that to even storage of uh, national ID uh, databases like uh, your driving uh, license you know, being available online. Uh, you know, but of course we need to provide that security and that's where blockchain is essentially going to come in uh, to provide that sort of security for all e-commerce uh, related transaction. But there are, of course, a lot of different applications, but we do see the use of blockchain and this technology being very important even in the 5G era. Very good. Um, what I would like you to do now as a, a final question is, and, and this might be might be tricky because we've talked about future trends uh, for the last hour, but what would you say are some of the, the f exciting future trends that you see on the horizon? So maybe beyond some of the things we've discussed here mm -hmm. or um, 
do, do you see any companies that are really intelligently combining some of those technologies? Because this is this is what I'm seeing, this whole convergence and this came out in, in so many of your examples that we now have artificial intelligence, we have 5G, we've got virtual reality, and actually all of them are coming together to, to create this amazing future customer experience and consumer experience. So what are your future predictions um, if you now look look ahead in, in terms of technology what who, who wants to have a have a go at that i can i can go with this because uh, uh we had a discussion the other day about how uh, how christmas eve will look like in 2050 and that just got me thinking i was like you know christmas it will, it will be so much different than it is today and something that i really want to see by 2015 and i think it's going to be reali reality by, by by then is basically uh, enabling or realizing our childhood dream of actually getting presents from santa and have santa come down the chimney and, and basically have a chat with santa and you know engage uh, um, with him and talk with to him uh, during christmas eve and you know it sounds like a, a fantastic scenario but it's actually it's actually possible with all the artificial intelligence and the recommendation systems that you have embedded in all the retail systems in the world someone out there will know exactly what you want for christmas so you will just have to pay up front uh, like a, a certain amount and you will get the present uh, that you probably you know had in hindsight you, you had in your mind that you wanted to get something for christmas you didn't know what that was but you will get that surprising and that joy of basically opening a gift and and be surprised by santa and that santa will also come down uh, your chimney you'll have augmented reality glasses so you'll be able to see him uh, you'll you'll be able to sit down and enjoy a coffee and talk about uh, everything possible possible uh, and then you know this santa could actually be your augmented reality um uh, psych uh, psychologist uh, it could be an artificial intelligence systems uh, that basically uh helps you deal with your with your daily problems and hopes and fears and everything uh i could see this happening by all means uh, and it could be a solution that is uh you know distributed by just the provider or it could be a host of, of providers enabling this, um, this uh, kind of, um, uh, even with Santa kind of experience in my Very good. Yeah, the the meeting Santa in augmented reality or virtual yes. reality. Very good. Yes, mate. What what are your future predictions? I think uh, we we as a group have uh, you know uh, predicted that we will. Uh, start to see this whole era of internet of senses uh, appear by 2030 and and uh, you know we already see some of those trends kind of manifesting so i don't know if you have heard about tesla suit you know it has nothing to do with elon musk let me tell you but this is a company which is making a full body haptic suit uh, with sensors which are embedded in this haptic suit and and they are trying to encompass uh, you know, how we can merge uh, the other senses, which is the sen senses of, uh, you know, touch, uh, feeling uh, in in a virtual environment. So if you were to marry virtual reality with, uh, you know, haptic feedback, uh, you could have this suit. And those has, uh, you know, those type of things have a lot of applications in in a lot of corporate environments, whether that's going to be in training uh, simulations for, uh, you know, very high risk uh, sort of jobs that you can actually simulate. Uh, we know NASA is also using uh, Tesla suits to now train astronauts on, on these, uh, you know, situations that need to be simulated uh, as well. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, so it's not very radical to think that these technologies will not exist by 2030. Uh, another example is uh, this, this sort of uh, company called OVR technology, and they are building this small wearable device, which is a, a scent dispenser that attaches to your virtual reality headset. And again, they are trying to digitize your sense of smell uh, in a virtual environment. So imagine walking into, you know, just as taking a break, if you just wanted to walk in a forest and, and have the scent of the fresh uh, forest, you know, now we can actually simulate that and, and get you those sort of experiences in a virtual environment in a way. So we already are starting to see the start of digitization of a lot of our senses and it won't be too far off. I mean, I'm I'm predicting that this might happen even before 2030, that we will already start to see 
uh, some of our sensors being digitized with a combination of a lot of immersive technologies, 5G, cloud computing, uh, XR, uh, and all the new form factor devices that we are talking about, we will be able to realize uh, this vision of Internet of Senses much earlier than 2030. Amazing. Yeah, and this, this is, these are all things I, I cover in my book, and I find this so fascinating that, that this whole idea that you could um, bring together all the different senses of touch and smell with virtual reality. And for me, the, the next step beyond this then is to have some sort of a computer brain interface so you don't, exactly. you don't you no longer rely on glasses and haptic suits because in the end your brain is is taking digital information and processing it so if you can put this straight into your brain you can actually put vision and sound and 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 touch and all those senses straight into your brain which is mind-blowing i think when you exactly to that point Literally. Fantastic. This has been such an amazing session. Thank you so much, Yasmid and, and Christina. Thank you for to do this again. Uh, I've had so many really good comments on the stream saying, uh, um, Prashad is saying, great session, a, a lot of great information. Um, Luisa is saying, great. Uh, Santa, yes, amazing. <laughs> so, Anyone listening live now, let us know what you think. Share with us your comments and views on, on today's session. As I said, if you want to listen to any of these sessions, again, head to my YouTube channel where you can see all of them, lots of amazing, great conversations, or you can listen to this on my podcast. This will be available as a podcast episode, and there are many other similar exciting sessions available to, for you to listen to. Thank you very much, um, and hopefully we will do this again soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye.